What was your favorite piece of advice you learned in today's sales talk? Well, you know, basically just do it, you know, and uh, uh, the paralysis of analysis um, is definitely something you don't want to get into. You want to um, have a vision, like the gentleman says, and, and take action. It was a great presentation. Uh, it's, it, it's so much value to be at one of these um, seminars and to learn so much about entrepreneurship. What I enjoy about these is that I'm a dyed-in-the-wool entrepreneur and um, I'm always interested to listen to how other entrepreneurs have uh, reached their successes and their trials and tribulations. Gets up at four o'clock in the morning and is in the office at five. 
That's what it takes, okay? So please, allow me to uh, introduce Frank Benarini. As Vice President, member experience, Frank is responsible for defining and delivering the overall direction of the rewards portfolio. A focused and inspirational leader, Frank leads a dynamic team with the accountability for ensuring the quality, quantity, and competitiveness of the Air Mile reward portfolio offering, which is central to driving collector and sponsor, sponsor engagement in the program. This is achieved through the alignment of rewards, external partner relationships, product portfolio design, pricing decisions, marketing strategies to the overall corporate and brand strategies, macro and micro marketplace trends, and organizational capabilities capacity. Sounds like an easy job to me. <laughs> Frank has been with Loyalty One for seven years and brings with him over 30 years of business experience. He firmly believes in developing strategies that benefit all partners while driving new customer experiences. Prior to joining the Air Mile Rewards Program, he started his career with Shoppers Drug Mart before transitioning to Canada's oldest retailer, Hudson's Bay Group, uh, Senior uh, Manager, Divisional Merchandise Manager, and then he spent several years as Director uh, uh, in Marketing Merchandising with EB Games, eventually shifting gears and taking on the role as Director for Marketing at Blue Notes. In his roles, playing both sides of the buyer and the seller, he discovered and will share to you, with you today the common traits that define salesmanship. And by actively building on these traits, you too can develop into a stronger leader and sales professional. Whether you work in an organization or have a business, these characteristics will set you apart from other competitors, as well as help shape and create your winning sales strategy for overall company success. Please, please join me in welcoming a big welcome to Frank from the Durham region. Frank. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, everybody. I really uh, do uh, take a lot of pleasure in being here today and sharing some stories with you, talking a little bit about my experience. My first slide, because Frank wanted me to talk about my story, but he already did that, was really to tell you a little bit about myself. This is a little bit like coming home for me. When I started at Shoppers Drug Mart, I started as a store manager, and my first store was around the corner, uh, the Shoppers Drug Mart on Highway 2 in Dundas. So that was 30 years ago, and I can't believe how quick 30 years have gone by. But as Frank mentioned, I've had a lot of different positions throughout my career. I've had the opportunity of doing a lot of different things. Um, and I'd like to think I'm successful, not only in the fact that I've become a VP at one of the best companies in Canada, but also success meaning your private life. And there's a quote I wanted to read. I read this last night. The people who are successful are the ordinary ones that just go that little bit further, who give a little more than they're asked for, who live within that extra 5%. And I'd like to think that my career has been that. Just an average guy, went to college, um, no big university degree, and I've managed to do all right. And a lot of the people who are speaking or have spoke or are successful business people, I believe are really those people who just give that little bit extra, right? No one's special, there's smarter people, dumber people, but everybody can work hard. And the one thing I'm gonna go through today are the characteristics that I think, I don't know if they're right or wrong, I don't know if it's a complete list, but based on my experience, are the characteristics that I've seen where people are successful. Um, so I had a boss who once said to me, Frank, you're not the sharpest tool in the shed. <laughs> and, and, and you know, I took that really bad at the time. But then he continued with, you can outwork anybody. And what he wanted to say to me was, listen, there's a lot of smart people in the world. I hire MBAs out of school. They're all brilliant. Are they lazy? Can they think strategy? Are they action oriented? It's not about just being smart. It's not about just having certain characteristics. You gotta work hard. When I, when I look at successful people, and we all do this, man, they had a lucky break, something good happened to them, their parents gave them a business, but every successful person worked hard. Some examples, Mark Cuban, for seven years, he didn't take a vacation when he was starting his business. You look at the CEO of Apple, right? He starts his days at 4.30, starts sending emails. He's the first in the building, the last to leave the building. He has Sunday meetings with his team. 
to prepare for the upcoming week. Now you look at him, CEO of Apple, you know, how hard can that be? It's hard, but he's got a staff. You gotta work hard. Nothing comes easy. Kobe Bryant, if you look at athletics, was great because he spent hours practicing his jump shot. Nothing comes easy. You gotta work hard. And, and really that first slide is really about, you know, work hard, wake up, be nice, because I do believe that at the end of the day, you gotta be nice to people. And then just repeat that every day. Be yourself. When I first started to work, you know, I read every management book, and those books were full of advice. This is what you have to do. This is how you need to be. This is how you should lead a team. This is how you need to talk to people, right? So many words of wisdom. Then I got into the workforce, and it, I watched upper management. I got exposed to a lot of VPs and presidents, and you know what? None of them were that book, right? Uh, what they did have in common, across the board, drive, passion, vision. How they put that forward was different depending on who they were as an individual. So I would say to you, don't ever try to mimic anybody. Don't try to be anybody other than yourself. You are great. You really are. You have your own set of values, characteristics, the way you do things. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. But it doesn't mean you can't try to improve yourself, always be better. Um, the next day for yourself though because I learned that when I went into business and I tried to be somebody else it wasn't me so that would be the second piece of advice I would give you all just be yourself things don't have to be perfect everybody waits for the right time the right situation the right market conditions um, the right finances to come through. I could go on and on and on. And how many people never do what it, they need to do because they've waited for that perfect situation and it's never come? How many times have you thought you had an idea over the, your lifetime and then you drive by and you see a business that was your idea? And you go, damn, that could have been my idea. I had that idea. Someone else acted on it. I like Richard Branson from the stand, a couple of reasons I like him. A, love the fact he's a billionaire. But his story, I think, is so powerful because it's a story of not waiting for the perfect moment. He quit school at 16. He was dyslexic, I can't even say that word, dyslexic. Thank you. Um, right? He started a business out of a, at the bottom of a church uh, doing magazines. Then he actually ran into, through that, he started selling records, opened his own record label, didn't know what he was doing, but he started, he jumped in. And there was a story that I read about him, about Virgin Air. Anyone know how they, he started that business? So he was 27 years old, and he wanted to get to the Virgin Islands. Had a date, right? So he said, there's no way I'm gonna miss going. But unfortunately, the plane that he was going to take couldn't take off that day. So he chartered a plane. Figured he can't pay for it. How, what was he gonna do? So everyone in the airport who was supposed to be on his plane, he put up a sign, Virgin Air, $30 a seat. And he sold every seat on the plane for $30, which paid for the charter, and he didn't miss his date with that girl, right? But the point is, if you wait for things to happen, if you wait for the perfect situation, it's never gonna come. Throughout my career in business, I've had both things happen to me where we had an idea, it was a great idea, let's do some research, let's do some more research, let's do some analytics, let's do some research, not quite sure, and then your competitor beats you to the punch. You gotta go. Even if it's not perfect, you gotta go. So that would be my next piece of advice for all of you. And there's a, I like quotes if you can't tell, but there was a quote from General Patton which said, a good plan violently executed is better than a great plan never tried. And that's so true in anything you do, right? You gotta go, you'll fix the things that don't work, you'll learn from the things that don't work, move forward. Listening, 
If you don't understand, you can't help. There's a, a story I read the other day. It was about a donkey. So the donkey uh, had a bales of salt on his back. To get to the market, they had to cross a river. So the owner of the donkey said, donkey, here's the shallow part of the river. Cross. Donkey didn't listen. He went into the deepest part of the river. When he went into the deepest part of the river, the salt melted. He, was, he easily got up the other side and went up the bank, no problem. The next day, the merchant put wool on the donkey's back. Same thing happened. Donkey crossed the river here. The donkey, remembering that he, the day before, was able to get out of the river and go up easily by going through the deepest part, did the same thing. What happens with wool when it gets wet? It gets very heavy. So the donkey then had a hard time getting up the bank. What does that story really tell you? Just because something works once, don't think it's going to work again. You're all in business. If you always follow the same recipe for every situation, you stop listening to people, you stop understanding what they're saying, you're going to get into trouble. You may be successful sometimes because you do things your own way, absolutely, but you need to listen and understand. And, and the biggest story, I'm going to talk about Frank uh, momentarily. So besides the fact that he sucked up and came to the gym with me, right? <laughs> That, that, that was basically what happened. But uh, at the time when I was at Shoppers, I headed up the magazine category. And I had an idea about a new concept for a magazine rack at the checkouts. And it was something a little bit different than what that was done before. And in the industry, people used to quarterback your racks. Uh, so you'd go to one of the publishers. They would arrange for all the production, arrange for all the magazines to go on the stands. Um, basically do all the work for you. And it was pretty much a recipe. Frank came in and said, I'd like to do that for you. And he had no experience. He had hair at the time. Um, <laughs> and he got the business over other people who had more experience. And the only reason that he did was that he listened and he understood what I wanted. It wasn't about the same recipe over and over again that Loblaws or anyone else used. It had to be done a little bit different. I wanted it done my way. Don't know if that was right or wrong, but I wanted it my way. And Frank came back with a proposal that was able to get me what I wanted from that program. He listened. He did not go into it thinking he understood it. He listened to what we wanted as a business. He tailored his proposal to match the needs of the business, not his own individuals. And that's why he got that business. Right? I don't know if I ever told him that. So, um, but I, I think that's an example that Frank really showed that um, how listening and understanding what the actual objective of your client is, is what you need to do. Responsibility. I think from a, whether you work for a company or you're a small business, the one thing as individuals we're able to do is understand a situation and control your emotions around the situation and change how you think. So the story I like here, I want to hear about the shoe salesman who went to Africa. So two shoe salesmen went to Africa. I don't mean to be disrespectful to anybody, it's a story. So two companies sent two salespeople. And the first one called back home and he said, listen, I don't think this is a good idea. Nobody wears shoes in Africa. The second salesperson called back to the office and said, I can't believe it. No one wears shoes in Africa. It's a great opportunity. Same situation, two people looking at it very differently. What was the difference? The difference was their response to the situation. Anthony Robbins said, and I love Anthony Robbins, that we believe about the situation, what we believe about the situation causes our emotions. And our emotions usually determine what we do next, negatively or positively. Throughout my 30 years in business, 
I've seen good times, bad times, good economic times, good sales, bad sales, trends that come, trends that go. We, we've all seen that. The vendors who are still here, the vendors who are still servicing me, um, are the ones who went through those times, changed what they had to do, thought different about the situation, didn't hang up their coats and said, oh my god, in 2008 the economy is horrible, I'm going to go out of business. You change how you do things. You listen, you work hard, you change your approach. That's what you need to do. And, and that's irregardless of, again, whether you work for a company or you have your own business, it's just something that you need to do. You need to constantly evolve and change and keep your optimism, your positivity, find the way, right? Don't be negative. Begin with the end in mind. So vision is the most important thing. All of us have different businesses, different objectives, uh, whether you work for yourself or for a company, we all have a vision. And you need to believe and trust in that vision. It could be right, it could be wrong, but if you don't have a vision of where you're going, you're never gonna get there. When I was with Hudson's Bay, I ran the Club Z program, we, um, it was a catalog business. I had some ideas about what I wanted to do with vendors, how I thought vendors should work with us. And one of the key electronic vendors at the time, probably the biggest one at the time, didn't agree with what I wanted to do with the business. They, at the time, this is going back to 1999, 2000, they were doing $8 million with us and uh, they had most of the number one brands, I stopped doing business with them. Don't know if that was right or wrong. The next year though, they came back. The electronic business increased that year. My margins increased that year. And they came back to the table and said, we'd like to participate under your terms. Um, but it was about a vision. And sometimes, you know, you have to make decisions. It was a hard decision to say to that vendor, I'm not going to carry the product. But it was the right decision for what I wanted to do. Don't know what, if what I wanted to do was right or wrong, but that's how it goes. And sometimes you make mistakes. The next year I tried that with KitchenAid. Not such a good idea. <laughs> they didn't, didn't, quite, they didn't quite work out the same way. But all of you have to have a vision. You have to know where you want to go. It's so easy to be swayed by circumstance, situation, your neighbor says something to you that, oh my God, maybe I didn't think that through. And we take people's opinions and we start doubting ourselves. Don't. Whatever your vision is, stick to it. It's the right vision. And if it's not the right vision, you'll change it. Say what you mean. Do what you say, you're as good as your last promise. And that really is the reality of, of it. If you say you're gonna do something, do it. Abraham Lincoln, see I told you I like all these little stories, right? He was riding in a coach with a colonel, and the, they had a nice conversation. The colonel said, would you like a smoke? And Abraham Lincoln said, no, thank you. And they continued their discussion, they had a great discussion. And he pulled out a little flask of whiskey, and he said, would you like a drink, Mr. Lincoln? And he said, you know, we've had such a great conversation, and I really would like to have a drink with you. But let me tell you a story. My mother was on her deathbed when I was very young, and she made me make her a promise. She said, promise me you'll never drink or smoke. He said, so sir, would you like me to break that promise to my mother, even though I'd love to drink with you? And the colonel said, absolutely not. I wish I could have made those promises. There may be times when in business you say you're going to do something, situations will change, um, you made a mistake with the pricing, something happened. You do what you say you're going to do, you finish what you said you were going to start. I've had countless vendors who I worked with who you know, halfway through a program came to me and said, 
there was an error, I couldn't do it. Some of them said we need to change pricing. Some of them said I'll honor the pricing. Whatever the situation was, the vendors who are still with me are the ones who honored their price. I will go back to those vendors. I will work with those vendors. I understand it's a two-way street. You lose today, you win tomorrow, right? But if you say you're going to do it, if you make a proposal, if there's something you're going to do, it's your integrity at stake. And if you lose your integrity, you lose everything. Take initiative. So, so important. We all had either team members or vendors um, who just do what they say they're going to do. But no more. So a father had two sons. The older son went to the father and said, Dad, how come my younger brother has more responsibility and he gets more reward than I do? The father said, OK, I'll tell you why. I'll show you why. They had a flock of geese. So he said to his older son, we need to increase that flock of geese. Go to the Stanleys and ask them if they have geese to sell. So the son came back and he said, yes, they have geese they can sell. How much do they, go ask them how much they want. So he went off, came back, said 10 pounds. Can they, sell, can they bring them to us tomorrow? Off he went, comes back and he says, yes, they can deliver them tomorrow. He said, okay, now watch, son. Called the younger brother from the field where he was working and he said, we need to grow our flock of geese. Can you go to the Davidsons and find out if they have geese to sell? So the younger son came back and he said, yes, they have geese to sell. They'll sell them for 10 pounds each. If we buy 10, they'll sell them for eight. I've arranged to have the five delivered today within the next hour. And if we take the next five tomorrow, they'll give it to us for six pounds. The father looked at the older son and the son understood. We all are in situations where you, clients will ask you for things. Listen, understand what they're really saying, understand what they want, work hard, deliver more than what's asked for. When I did the rack with the shop, when I was at Shoppers Drug Mart, the magazine rack, Frank could have came back with a proposal that simply said, you wanted X. It's not enough. Even though I asked for X, there's so many people who are willing to do the extra, go the extra mile, think about what else they can do. They're the ones who are going to move ahead and get the business. Don't just do what's asked. If you ask your kids, sweep the floor, but the garbage is full and they leave the garbage there, what do you tell your kid? You could have thrown out the garbage. Now, you didn't ask me to. You told me to sweep the floors. It's not enough. It's, it's never enough. You need to always give that extra 5%. Back to the Bear Gryllis example. Average people can succeed and do more if they're willing to do that extra 5% more. Irregardless of your own business or not, you have to always do that a little bit extra. I've dealt with hundreds of vendors, thousands maybe, and the really good vendors are the ones who don't come in with a prescribed um, list of here's what I want to sell you, here's how I want to sell you. They come in and they understand or they listen and they try to understand what we need as a business and they're able to change the proposals to meet the needs of the customer, not their own needs. Right? That might work sometimes, but it won't in the long run. Network. Sounds so simple. Frank and I have gone back 30 years. The speakers in this room who have spoken have known Frank for a long time. When he wanted to set this up, he went to his network. He went to the people he knows, the people he has relationships with, and he asked them, are you willing to do this? And, and we all said, absolutely. Networking isn't about the just grow my LinkedIn account. Anybody can do that. It's about having meaningful relationships, and you don't have to take a lot of time. Every six months, you send someone out to say, hey, how are you doing? Right? Don't want to have a coffee with them because you're busy? Don't say, let's have a coffee. 
How's the family? It's a simple thing to do. My air mile story is really about networking. I worked with somebody at Shoppers Drug Mart who ended up being chief marketing officer at Air Miles. Through the years, we kept in touch once every six months, once a year, and uh, you know, we spoke, we chit-chatted, our kids were the same age, so we had that in common. When the opportunity at Air Miles came, he was aware of my background. So I worked in retail, I worked in loyalty, I worked in marketing, I did supply chain, I was a buyer, and you know, at that time I started to think, is it better to have maybe gone deep into one career path and become an expert? And I was really starting to think through, did I make mistakes jumping around and trying to get a bigger, broader perspective about business versus really specializing? And then I get a call from uh, Neil, who was a friend of mine, he said, hey Frank, we're looking for somebody, but we're looking for somebody who has loyalty experience, marketing experience, has done buying, understands supply chain. Wow, that's me. So the network for me really is about letting people know who you are, maintaining those personal contacts. Everybody knows someone who's fake, right? You know, and you disregard them. But networking in its right sense, and I find as I've gotten older, that network is really something that helps you, whether it's from a personal perspective or from a work perspective, network and mean it. Working hard, people will say you're a workaholic. Um, but you know, you've all heard, if you do what you love, it's not really work. And we all think, oh, that's bullshit. But it's really not. It, it really isn't. My, the biggest thing that I hate to hear from people is, I hate my job. So quit. Because if you hate what you're doing, it impacts everything you do in life. Not just work, it'll impact your relationships, your free time, your activities. You can't go to work for eight to 10 hours and leave it and think you're going to change how you feel. You can't. You want to be successful, you got to love what you do, you got to want to be wherever your business is. And it isn't about work at that point, it's about liking what you do. I love my job. I get to work, like Frank said, I'm at work 5 a.m. in the morning. Don't need to be, but I like what I do, right? And I also know you gotta work hard to move ahead. Anybody that tells you you don't need to work hard is full of shit, right? That's just how it is. And everybody knows it, but everybody wants to find that little pill or that magic thing that will allow you to be rich and famous and successful without the hard work. I'm gonna tell you. Maybe there's people who can do it. Most people I know can't. So the important thing is if you like what you do, you love what you do, it won't be work. You'll put your heart and soul into it. Oh, you guys can't hear me? No, I can't hear you. Oh, it was off all this time? <laughs> do you want me to start from the beginning? And you know, the last slide is really, life is short, have fun. And it sort of goes back to what I talked about. If you like what you're doing, you're going to have fun. Make time for family, friends. Um, I don't think about it as work-life balance, because I don't believe in work-life balance. It's life. In life, you're going to work, you're going to play, things will go right, things will go wrong. That's just how life is. So it isn't about, I'm going to spend eight hours today at work, and I'm going to spend eight hours at home, and I'm going to sleep for eight hours. You know what? Some days you're going to work 16 hours. Some days you might work three hours, right? It's not about the balance. It's about how you live your life. And while you're living your life, you have to make sure you're taking the time out for the special moments, right? Your kid's graduation, right? Big deal at the time. Maybe it's okay to miss it. You look back. You need to be at those things. You need to make time. You need to have fun. You need to spend time with friends and family. So I don't know if those are all, is the complete list of the characteristics that you need to be successful. 
they're what I believe. Uh, so take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> if you got something today out of this, um, it's great. But I really think that at the end of the day, you know what, there's certain key characteristics that everybody has to go through. And you always look at the person next to you and think their life is better or the grass is greener. It's not. Everyone's got their own crosses to bear. Uh, everyone has their own issues. Live your life to the fullest. Be successful. That's what I wish you. Frank wants to know if there's any questions for Frank. <laughs> no, I think you so guys make some examples about um, uh, in today's world, you're a brand. Yeah. And you have to look at your brand and, and um, you thought to yourself, okay, should I, stay, should I have stayed in one track? Should I have just concentrated in one track? And obviously in today's world, we can't do that because yeah. the world is changing and morphing and so is business. Yeah. So to be um, a strong person in each area and then to your point about networking, the old adage, not what you know, who you know, but more importantly, yeah. knows you. And 80 to 90% of what it is out there is network. So the right person made the right call and said, I need X. And yeah. you went, I'm X. Exactly. But you know, if, uh, if you had just applied to their HR department, for example, they wouldn't necessarily have seen you in that, but because that CMO knew what they were looking for uh, for their team, you were the perfect recipe for that. Yeah. So Janine works for Mandrake. So talk about networking. If there's a million dollar a year role that you'd like me <laughs> to, uh, uh, you I'll call make. me and I'm there. See, that's not, no. yeah. but, but absolutely, you know what? If they don't know you, my kids are young. They, they're starting their careers. They send a resume. I tell them all the time. You know, it's going to get part of the paperwork. You have a great resume. A thousand people have a great resume, right? You're not the, the best of the best of the best, even though I love my kids, right? But it's, if you're interested in a job, find out who's hiring. Find out the company. Try to make a contact, right? Call the president of the company. What, what do you have to lose? You have absolutely nothing to lose except not getting the job. Yes, Louis. What motivates you every morning? What, like, where's your drive coming from? You're up at 4 o'clock in the morning. What's driving you? You know, it's changed over time. So at the beginning, I think it was really about young family, kids. You want to work hard. You want to grow. You want to become um, a vice president, this, that. And it was money, right? At the end of the day, it was money that motivated you because you wanted to give to your family. And then as you started to achieve certain success, then it became about wanting to be the best I could be and trying to do what I like to do and making a difference. Now, making a difference um, is different for everybody, right? For me, it's about um, at work being able to hit the financials, give collectors or our customers what they want. If I can balance those two things, to me, that's what becomes important. So I think running a business, if it's your own business, you need to answer what motivates you. Is it just the money? But if it's just the money, you might be successful, and I wish you are. But if it's a deeper drive about doing what you're doing and being the best at what you do and giving the ultimate customer experience, that will bring success to you financially, and hopefully it'll bring success to you in other ways as well. Oh, I got a couple of stories of where I waited too long um, and that hit home. But I think through the course of business now, I've come to realize that, you know, I've worked for people who would say, great idea, go do some research. Then you'd bring them the research and they'd say, dig deeper into the analytics. And then they would say, Operationally, how would you execute it and work with BT to find a solution and is it the optimal solution? And an idea that is awesome ends up going for a year and a half because people A, either won't make a decision or B, they're scared to make a decision 
or they want to get all the Sometimes you got to go with your gut. And I'm a big believer in gut. Um, maybe it's my 30 years of experience. Someone comes to me with an idea and I think it's the right idea, just do it. What's the worst that's going to happen? It fails and you learn, right? Or you might find something that works great. There's nothing that you can do or break. It's my kids with computers or when they're playing with things. Just do it. Don't worry about it. What's the worst that's going to happen? Something's going to break. So what? We fix it, right? But so many times you just wait for that perfect situation and it never is. Frank, give us your best and your worst as a, you've been on both sides of the table as a buyer and, of course, on the other side. Give us the best that you saw where somebody just blew you away on a, on a call and why did you do business with them outside of the magazine rack? And then on the flip side, if you could, what would be the, the worst that you saw and why did you not do business with that person? Well, the worst is the easiest one. Okay. The worst is when someone comes to see you with their own ideas, their own objectives, and they want to sell you because it makes sense for them. In the last, we did an RFP a few years ago uh, for our uh, fulfillment business. And we went through, I don't know, 10 companies, got it down to three. And then the three companies we had, two were extremely big companies. And then there was a smaller company, um, didn't have all the technology that the other two had, but they had a willingness to work hard. And they didn't come to the table with, you know, here's the 17 things that we can do from a technology perspective. Here's the 30 things we can do from this. Those two companies came to us with a, here's how we do business. And here's how we would fit your business into what we do. The other company came and said, we're willing to work with you to understand what you need so that we're able to deliver you an experience that meets your objectives. So to me, any time that you're dealing with a customer, don't, it's like the donkey. Just because it worked once for somebody, right, isn't going to work all the time. Take the time to understand what the person wants. Can you do it? Maybe you can't. Do it anyway, right? If you're 80% of the way there, do it. You'll find the way to do it. But Frank, I think the key thing is don't go in with a prescribed methodology that you want for your own purposes. I think it's about finding and understanding what the other person wants. Any meeting I go into with any partner, my first question is what is your objectives? I need to understand what the other person wants so that I'm able to take advantage of them and get what I want. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> sort of kidding. Sort of kidding. But, but, but you have to understand what the other person wants. In any negotiation, if you don't know where the, what the other person wants, you'll never be able to, to create the win-win. Yeah? Yeah, um, you talked about uh, the ongoing research and so forth, and it never ends. Uh, uh, I, understand, I call it the paralysis of analysis. Absolutely. Yeah. So how did you react, though? Um, did you go to Madeline? Did you get him to try and... Um, change the, the, the strategy or, or so you know when you first started you did nothing <laughs> you said okay I'll go do it <laughs> right now that I'm in the role that I'm in uh, if my team has an idea uh, that I think is worthwhile to pursue try it right now some things are easier done than others some you need BT work you need things that um, you just can't go out and try as simple as you say go ahead and do it but there's a lot of things that we can do that doesn't need a lot of back-end uh, BT work. It's about you know, putting, changing a process or changing a, uh, a policy. Just do it. See what happens. So through the 30 years, I think I didn't get mentoring per se. 
what I got from everybody who I reported to was good and bad, right? What worked, what didn't work. Um, I had some great bosses and I had some shitty bosses. Um, but I learned from all of them, right? Because all of them were able to um, give you some piece of advice or you'd see something from that. They didn't get to where they were for no reason. So, so you can take something from everybody. Um, you know, one of the things that I would love to do is when I end my career is teach. Because I think if you can positively influence one person, make a difference to one person, that's success. So I spend a lot of time mentoring younger people in the organization. Um, and it's, you know, that mentoring really is about what do they want to get out of it, right? And it's, um, I, I spend time with people who who want to grow, who want to learn, who want to do better. Um, there's no entitlement. So we've all probably known or met people who graduate with an MBA and they think they should be making $200,000 a year and they should be vice presidents and they don't want to work hard. They just want to, I got no time for those people, right? Um, but the people who really want to make a difference, the people who want to grow, who want advice, I'll spend a lot of time with them. I have a question, Frank, if you wouldn't mind. So, you know, obviously I'm 54. When I was growing up, it was all about trying to get a good job with benefits, company vehicle, and all that good stuff. Do you remember those days, eh, Glenn? <laughs> That's changed quite a bit. What advice, Frank, would you have to folks like uh, the folks from Hammond Watches, uh, uh, our young entrepreneur there, that would differ? Because obviously, 30 years, you've gone from working at store level on the floor to vice president of Air Miles, which is a, a wonderful way. But if that's not realistic today, what advice would you give these young men and women as entrepreneurs as they're coming up with new ideas like Ham and Watches? Why isn't it realistic today? I just, I just see because it's all part-time work. You know, uh, four jobs, uh, no benefits. You have to have two, three contract work. So do you yeah, still so? see that? Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so? so? You work hard, you have a vision, you like what you do, you keep trying. You know, my kids say the same thing. Things are different, blah, 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 blah. They are, like social media is different, how you use marketing is different, absolutely. The core characteristics that make you successful as an individual, whether it was 30 years ago or now, are the same. You got an idea? Work hard, right? Be nice to people, have a vision, right? Listen, right? Nothing's changed in terms of that. Maybe I've just got my head in the sand, and you know, that could be, be true. How you do business changes. The characteristics of doing business, I don't believe, have changed. I think to that point, um, our generation generally stayed in one job. Yeah. You're a little different, and I can see when you said, you know, was I doing the right thing? Yeah. Um, I think with um, entrepreneurs now, we have to look at the new generation, and they're going to bring expertise as they move along where it's no longer just stay, stay the course. So that's why I'm thinking maybe you're speaking of a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so, so, you know, absolutely. You know, everyone talks about the new generation coming into the workforce. You know, from an, even from an Air Miles perspective, we're changing buildings, changing the design of the building, how people work. Um, you know, people won't want to work at a desk anymore. Absolutely, all those things will change. But the core characteristics, I don't believe do, right? What you provide them in terms of benefits or how they work, yeah, that's going to change. And even then, I, I talk to my kids and their friends, and you know, there's all this, this is what the Gen X wants. And then I ask them, they go, no, not really. But they just, you know, you have a few people out there, the outliers, but most people just want, they want to come in, they want to do a good job, they want to get paid well, they want the same things we wanted. They want to raise a family, yeah, the mortgages are going to be huge, they want uh, security in the role. Will they move around a little bit more? Perhaps. So. That's a good thing. Yeah. Frank, working in a big company like Air Miles, you meet a lot of different people. Um, two questions. How do you attract youth to your business, to your organization? And then how do you uh, get them to do, because I know you're very strict and you're very hard and fair. <laughs> I've softened in my old age, man. Listen, you're you're like you're a hard like you're you're a hard guy to tough up, you know, um, to keep up with. So how do you get the youth to do what you want them to do? 
like most people so, look at the clock saying, okay, I, I'm so from, check, you know, I'm so, ready to go. Four, five so two questions. So yeah. from attracting talent, we're lucky enough that our company is always in the best companies to work for. So we have lots of new people coming in, whether it's through internships, co-op programs. Um, so really, we get a lot of people coming through the doors who want to work for us. Not really an issue that way. In terms of um, my expectations, my expectations are for me, right? People who work for me, they're either going to make it or they're not going to make it. It's not about what I do. I come in at 4 in the morning. Don't expect them to be there at 4 in the morning. Some of them, if they're smart, would be. You know, bring me a coffee. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, you, you know what? At the end of the day, everyone manages their career. I don't know if there's a... My way may not be the right way. Because I know so many people who will come in the office at 9.30, but then they go home and they work till 1 in the morning. I don't do that. Everyone has their own way. What you want from your team is, do they deliver what they're supposed to deliver, on time, good quality, and I'm not fussed, and this is where I've changed. Uh, I'll give you an example. We have summer hours at work. So summer hours is you work an extra half hour every day, and then you get every other Friday half day off. So you make up for your time. So I used to be the guy who used to say, OK, who's taking summer hours? What times are you going to work? Mark it down. You didn't come in at 8.30 today. <laughs> oh, my God, right? Uh, that's bad on you. This year, my policy was, I don't care. You know, you want to work. Is the work done? Is it done right? Is it done on time? Right? That's what I care about, right? So it's about focusing people on, you don't want to babysit them. You have to assume everybody is an adult. Everybody will do the right job. If they don't, the other thing that I've learned is you need to act quickly. You quickly know if they're the right fit or not. If they're not, get rid of them. Right? So many times I've hung on to people because I thought they would change. I could change them, give them a chance. And there was a saying that said, once somebody shows you who they are, that's who they are. Right? So when you know that the person's not a fit, how many times, and, and I've done this, have you kept somebody who you knew is wrong, but it was a body? It was easier to keep that person there because they sort of knew what they were doing. They'd come in, they'd get the work done. Because if I let that person go, now I got to go find somebody. I got to train them during that time. Oh my God, what's going to happen to the work? And you keep them. Biggest mistake you can make. Because that person will cost you more in the long run staying there, motivating other people around them. Why are they keeping that person? Not, maybe I shouldn't be working that hard. They're doing, uh, right? They talk. Get rid of them. I know that's horrible to say, right? But, but really, if they're not a fit, they got to go. What else can I tell you guys? <laughs> Frank, what's your, so now you've, you've reached the VP role. You've, Well, if she finds me the million dollar a year job, well, that change, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know, at the end of the day, I don't know what my next move is. I like what I do. I enjoy what I do. The company's treated me well. Um, is there opportunity for growth? There still is opportunity for growth within the company. At, at this point. I do the best I can do. I do the best job I can do. And we'll see where it goes. I don't have plans in terms of what the next move is. Sorry, yeah. I just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I like the fact that you said that you were motivating people forward. You know, you're grooming, you're teaching, which yeah. I like. Okay. Especially at our age group, you know, that you know, you've, you've learned so much. All this experience, all this knowledge that you share, that you have. How do you so? How do you get your people to, or your your, your students or your your, your younger generation, uh, to listen? Or how do you get their attention? I know it's a different group of the, our generation compared to the new generation. It's just a little different. Uh, um, and so, the, so how do you grab their attention? So here's a question somebody asked me, and it made me think. They said, "Who's worked for you? Who's now successful?" So a good leader breeds leaders who can then teach other people leadership. So there's a lot of people I know who 
are good leaders from the standpoint of they've hit their numbers, whatever, but they haven't groomed anybody for their role. So for me, it's about when I mentor people, hopefully what we do is we allow them to show their leadership skills that they can teach other people. You need to allow them to make mistakes. You can't do all the work, right? I used to think I could do it all. I, I'm old, I can't do it anymore. You have to give people rope. They're either gonna hang themselves or they're gonna do the job. And you know what? It's about letting them make decisions, then going back. It's easy to just fire somebody. So remember what I said, just let people go. If they're the wrong fit, absolutely. You don't let people go for making mistakes though. Did you give them the right advice? Did you teach them properly? Did you give them time? Did you, did you, did you, did you? And then if they make the mistake, have you gone back and helped them understand what they could have done different? Uh, so for me, being a leader is really about being able to mentor people that want to be there, and you can't force a horse to water. They got to want to be there first and foremost. You got the right fit, that's what you need. Then you need to let them do what they need to do, and you have to be okay with that. If it's going to cost you $1,000 because they made a mistake, it's got to cost you. It's the only way they're going to learn, right? And you can't get mad when they make that mistake. What you have to do is make them understand what they did. And usually it's with questions, not by telling them. Louis, you did this wrong. This is what you should have done. Louis, what would you have done different next time, right? You can't tell people. People don't learn by telling them, right? They learn by doing by understanding, and you have to make them understand. And you do that by asking questions. Did that answer your question? That's a good point. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. excellent. Frank, last question. Very good. Um, so a lot of folks in here would have a product or service that may be conducive to air miles. Yeah. What would your advice be to the folks who may have a product or service on how to go about to get into an air miles? Not putting you on the spot here, but you know. Send me a note, <laughs> tell me you'll give me the product for free for six months, <laughs> and we'll talk. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really simple. Um, my advice is knock on the doors. Um, so if you have a product that you want to sell to Air Miles, I don't know how many of you do, how many of you would have a product you could sell to Air Miles in this room? Yeah, you okay. So my question would be, have you called anybody? Have you done anything? What, what action steps have you taken? Did you identify who can buy your product, who the market is, what have you done? So my first advice to anybody would be, if you have a product that you want to sell, who do you want to sell to, and then what are you going to do? I'm not going to come knock on your door, right? Maybe for Apple, maybe. <laughs> uh, but the reality is, is you make your own destiny, right? You want to sell to an Air Miles, find out who the buyers are, call them. Tell them about your product. Uh, understand what our objectives are, right? Don't just sell the product. Hey, I got a great watch. You're working on a watch, right? I have a great watch for you. Yeah, so what? Everybody does, right? What makes you special? If you ask me, what are you looking for? And then you tailor your approach. I have this great new watch. I'll give you an exclusive. That might catch my attention. But understand the objectives of the person you are seeing and then you're able to sell to them because you're able to sell what their needs are, not the product. So Frank, on that note, okay, so... Do you want me to come work for you, Louis? <laughs> <laughs> you know the price. I'm getting dollars. I can't afford dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a lot of sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> Does it look like I need sandwiches? <laughs> so Frank, on that note, okay, because like, like in reality, sure we can call them Air, Air Miles, and you probably get a million calls a day, it's all who you know. In, in my experience, my best customers are the people that you know that refer me, right? So yep. I can call you. You say, "Yeah, who are you?" Yeah, just, yeah. Send me an email. I'll never get a call back. So, what's your best advice to a vendor? Like, so, how do listen. we get through to a company like Airmiles just got millions of like thousands of listen, people? Listen, networking absolutely is important. Yeah. Someone sent me a deck yesterday, right, with a new concept. Intrigued the hell out of me. I never met this guy. He's from Finland. Right? The deck caught my attention. So yeah, networking is important, Louis, but to just put out there to say, I'm never going to get in with a company because I don't know anybody. No, no, I didn't say that. What catches my attention is, here's a new innovative product. Here's how I can make money. 
and they've positioned it for me, Air Miles. Not for them. How did they get it to you? They sent me an email. Well, we don't know your email. People, 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 they went to LinkedIn, they found me on LinkedIn, they sent me a LinkedIn message, I replied. What I tell all my buyers, right, and everyone's different, you return every phone call because you never know who's going to have that great idea. Now they might spend two minutes with you, you have 30 seconds to make an impression, right? I'm another watch guy, yeah, I don't know, whatever, right? <laughs> but here's what I can do for you. That presentation of this guy who linked me in, sent me a presentation, caught my attention. It can be done. He told me how much money I can make, and it's a product that I haven't seen before. Right? So if you're competing in sandwiches, and you go to some guy who sells sandwiches, and you say, I have a sandwich I can sell, but I'm dealing with Frank. What do you think is going to make me listen to you instead of going with somebody I've done business with for three years? Consulting gig, I see it coming. What's that? A consulting gig, I see it coming. <laughs> <laughs> Why would he think he was getting all free advice right now? <laughs> That's good. And, and, Lou, and I know Louis a long time, so Louis can always get advice from me. Yes? Absolutely. But you know, the, th the reality is, you said nobody wants their kids to grow up to be a salesperson. We're all salespeople. Yeah, exactly. We sell every day. Yeah. We sell something. <coughs> we sell when you were dating, you sold yourself, right? I mean, you, you do. You every, every day you sell. I, I was, when I was a buyer, I was selling the company. I'd go to vendors and say, here's why you want to do business with me, right? So salesmanship, I think, is something they should teach in school. But it's something that is done every day, whether you're a salesman or not, you do it every day. Who? Oh, I'm sorry. I stayed in bed and I cried. <laughs> you, you know, um, first of all, I would say that being positive or optimistic is just who you are as an individual, right? And something you can practice, so you either are or not. And if you're not, try to figure out how you can be. Um, so that's just my personality, right? But I think, you know, through the years I've been in tough situations. Um, no one wants to talk about expiry last year. Um, but the reality is that, um, the, 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 so, so I, I think it's really about, you know, what's going wrong? Trying, you, you know, you got to put things in perspective for yourself, and you got to be honest with yourself. I think the biggest thing is self-awareness. So many people aren't self-aware of what they're doing wrong because they look at it from the perspective of this is what I'm doing or this is what I want and this is why it's not working. Well, you know what? Maybe you're just not doing things right. Don't know, you know, there's a lot of reasons why things could go wrong, but I think the first thing is if things aren't going the way you want, why aren't they? There's always reasons. Are you willing to change those things? 
right? And are you willing to um, look at yourself honestly to understand maybe what you're doing wrong? And then there's some things, you know, some people will just fail a hundred times until they're successful. That's okay. Failures, you learn. You just got to keep moving forward. Sorry, you said you had a second question. Well, Yeah. Duty, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I'm not going to talk about no. what happened with Air Miles, and you know, that's not the point of the discussion. But no. yeah, I mean, that was a period of time in terms of a career perspective that, you know, was tough. But you keep moving forward, right? Yeah. So. Every day is a new day. Every day is a new day. And ends with a Y. Anything else, guys? Okay. Frank, that was awesome. Thank you very much for Thank coming for in today. Me. Oh, that was brilliant. Um, I just wanted to ask a couple quick questions for sure. you. And one of the thoughts I had was we talked about and asked a question about mentoring and all of these things that help drive you and, and what gets you up in the morning and what makes you successful. Uh, what things can you offer back to the young audience that says, you know what, here's three things to focus on. Your strategy is going to change. Your, what you want in life is going to change. Focus on X, and that's going to make you successful for the next year. Does it have a plan? Does it have a strategy? What thing makes it really worthwhile for you? You, you? you know, what I would say to everybody is everyone's different. So I wouldn't give advice like that because I don't know what each individual wants. I would say for any young person listening, it would be about making the best of your situation always knowing what you want and then working hard to achieve it those are the three things i would say that any young person would need to do and what's your advice you could, you could interview me what's uh, what's your advice for a salesperson because everybody's been talking about this drive and, and all these things and i think one of the things that really stuck out to me was you talked about a cv and showing up and being different and at one time, I'd given this advice to a, a young person. I said, you know what, show up in a banana outfit with your CV. And then when the manager comes out, unzip it, drop it, show them that you have business acumen. But do it because you want the attention. So who's going to remember who you are when you do that? What kind of things would you do to get those people to stand out in front of that stack, of pi a pile of paper? Yeah. You know, that's interesting. You have to have the right personality to do that, though, right? And it goes back to being who you are. So for me, it would be more about... Uh, if you're comfortable with doing something like that, great advice. But the way you're going to stand out is try to make a net, try to make a connection. Um, if you want to work for Company X, make connections into Company X. Find out what they do, all about them. Find out who the president is. Reach out to the president. And your piece of advice, I've told my kids sometimes on a resume, do something totally different. But it's got to match who you are. And they're, they're not that way. So. Um, Everybody's different. Like I said, I think you have to be comfortable with who you are and accept who you are, and that's who you're selling. You're selling yourself. So if you, someone's thinking they're going to hire you because you wear a suit and a tie and you're polished, but it's not who you are, you won't keep that job. So be yourself. Awesome. That's great advice. And I think one last thing was... What's in it for you this year in 2017? What are your plans? What are your objectives? What are you trying to take down? What's your big goal for this year? I think my big goal for this year is really be the best I can be. That, that's the big goal. Nothing fancy. That's it. I like it. Well, that's some great advice, Frank. Thank you very much. We wish you the best, and you had an awesome talk today. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you to the city of Whitby, uh, BACD, and Vitalize and the OPN.ninja for taking this all out and putting it on so you guys have some great content. All the best.